So let me ask you about something that you wrote um, in 2014. Um, it was it was part of the Loose Leaf Notebook series. It was part three, a live concert in prison. Yeah. And you wrote, artistic expression is an enactment of freedom. And that your experience that day in the, pr in the prison's music class made you understand that in a new way. How has that understanding influenced the work you've done as a composer since that day seven years ago? Ooh, that's a great question right <laughs> off the bat. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I decided to teach in the music theory, uh, to, to teach in the maximum security prison, um, to teach music theory because I was just so intrigued by the idea that there were these, you know, men who were incarcerated for their, a lot of them were there for life. Um, a lot of them had been there since they were, you know, 18. Um, and they wanted to study music theory. And I felt like, well, I, I don't really like studying music theory. You know, what, uh, what is it that they want to learn? And um, really, a lot of them wanted to learn um, music theory so that they could write music and that they could write songs and they could write hymns and they could write raps and they could, you know, um, set their poetry to music. And um, I was just very blown away. I, I think, I think before I went into that um, prison and, and met the people there, I had a lot of doubt and um, insecurity about the role of classical music um, in our larger society and sort of felt very conscious of this idea that um, I was writing for a really small privileged um, group of people and that because of, um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of, of the way our society is set up um, and the inaccessibility of classical music, um, that maybe it wouldn't really touch a lot of people's lives or it would be sort of a limited amount of or a limited kind of people. Um, and I, I felt very uncomfortable with that. And so that was another one of my motivations for going in is to kind of you know, and I ended up playing my music for for these students, um, you know, and they were there for murder and I mean, like the, it's maximum security. So they're there for the worst kinds of of crimes. And, um, you know, to have I mean, one of the inmates, Gerald, told me, um, I, I mean, I kind of broke down in the last class and kind of asked them, like, is anything is any of this relevant to you? Like, is any of this music relevant to you? Is my music, because I played them some of my music, is, does it mean anything to you? Does it speak to you? And, and Gerald said to me, um, Julia, I, you know, I can tell from listening to your music how much you love to write and how much joy you get out of composing. And that makes me happy. I can feel the joy that, that you put into your work. And, you know, as long as you love doing what you do, other people will love it too. And I felt like he kind of gave me permission in a way to, to kind of uh, let go of what I thought I should or should not be doing in my music um, in terms of everything, you know, my vocabulary, what I was saying, and um, to just tune into my own voice and um, realize that that was really my best way to contribute musically. I mean, with Loose Leaf Notebook, I'm trying to do something else um, that contributes to a, a larger aspect of society outside of music. Um, but that's kind of my long answer to your question. It, it did kind of set me free in terms of letting go of my own expectations and maybe the expectations I had internalized in conservatory. Right. Right. And just for the record, as a lapsed piano performance major, I hated studying theory, too. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I don't know any theory and charity exercises. Those were the two things I didn't didn't enjoy. I mean, you know, it, it's important. I learned a lot, but it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun at all. It's not fun. Um, it's like calculus. That wasn't fun either. But it was a requirement at some point. Yeah. Um, when a commission comes your way, um, and I assume many have and will continue to do so, how do you decide which ones to accept and from which orchestras or companies? 
Well, I want to be excited. Um, and, you know, at, at this point, I'm at a place where I can make those kinds of decisions. I think at, at first you kind of say yes to everything, and that's really important. Um, and then you kind of start to figure out what, you know, what it is that you actually want to write. Um, but at this point, um, I want to be excited about the ensemble. I want to be excited about the soloist, if it's for a soloist. And I want to feel ideally that there's actually a collaborative um, element to it and that I'm going to feel supported by the organization. So, you know, I've been fortunate that, well, with this piece for the LA Philharmonic, um, you know, that Martin has been incredibly communicative and we, you know, send drafts, well, I send him drafts and then he'll give me feedback. Um, you know, the orchestra, I heard from a percussionist, you know, about a question about the part and, um, you know, great communication with the administration. I feel like that's communication and sort of mutual support is really, really important when you're especially spending months on one piece. It's interesting that you got a note from the percussionist because I was looking at the orchestration and I'm going, that is an intense amount of percussion you have in this piece. <laughs> I love percussion. <laughs> Well, it should be interesting to hear a violin, you know, do battle with that and try to find its way through. So, which I read as part of the notes on, on the LA Phil website. So why don't you tell me what inspired you to compose, you know, Woven Loom Silver Spindle? Well, um, I think one of the fun parts about a concerto is that it has a dynamic that's already set up, right? Which is the orchestra and the soloist. And so I think one of the first questions for every concerto is, um, what is that relationship between the two and how does it change over time? Um, and so I sort of thought of this piece in three movements um, where there's sort of a, uh, well, uh, and sorry, also you, you think about the, the specificity of that instrument. So the violin in, in particular, you know, has this beautiful, bright, sound and that's sort of where I came up with the idea of this kind of spindle silvery spindle image of sort of that that bright kind of yellow silver um, orange colors you know light green that you can kind of hear in a violin um, and so the the title it kind of evokes that relationship of the violin and the orchestra where the the orchestra is sort of the large woven loom that carries this kind of silvery thread throughout and um, the violin in the first movement is very kind of, they're somewhat unified, but uh, the violin is kind of trying to escape in a way or trying to assert her own voice um, out of the midst of this orchestra. And then in the second movement, there's a much more clearly combative uh, relationship. And then in the third movement, it's sort of like she's it created her own kind of smaller orchestra. So it's more intimate um, and it's more unified. I'm intrigued by the use of her as a pronoun for a violin. Uh, <laughs> you used it three times there. It's also in the notes that are on the LA Philharmonic's website. I know that an Italian violin is male and Russian it's female. I'm wondering if there was a specific reason why you choose to call the instrument her or she. Oh, just cause it's me. <laughs> so every like every instrument will be female if uh, I write it because that's my that's how I identify. Obviously, Martin, you know, <laughs> uh, is a man and identifies as a man, um, and so it's his voice and it will be him when he plays it. But when I'm writing it, I think of it as you know an iteration of myself, so it's female. So, do you think of all the instruments as an iteration of yourself? Yes. So, how much of your personality is therefore represented by? the music that you write for these instruments to play? All of it. <laughs> it's all there. So let's go back to the percussion. What does that tell us about you? Oh, well, I love, I mean, you'll hear in the percussion, I love like little twitchy sounds. Um, like I, I love kind of like sand blocks and wood, uh, wooden uh, wind chimes and um, kabasa and uh, there's this sort of like agitated, uh, I think you could, that I have that energy, I think. Uh, yeah, there's kind of an agitated, um, like crumpling sounds, um, some more kind of 
maybe ethereal, um, hopeful sounds, you know, in, in kind of glockenspiel, cymbal. Um, I got to work on my aggressive drums. They, uh, there's some, but that's an area that I should probably uh, develop a little bit more. Well, I'm wondering how much the, the, the times we live in influence how you feel a and lot. what you write by extension. I mean, it's interesting that you ask that in relation to this piece, because of course I wrote this during the height of the pandemic. Um, and this piece actually in particular, um, the move, the first and second movements are quite different in uh, feel. And part of, I, you know, I've never done this before, but I actually was switching back and forth between writing them um, based on what mood I was in. Um, because sometimes I just felt like it was so hard. Um, and I didn't want to live in this sort of darker, angrier music. And so the first movement is quite light and playful. And so I would do that when I felt that way. But then sometimes I felt like I, I had to be in that dark place because I was so angry or scared. And so then I would write the second movement. Um, so I, I, I've always written chronologically and this is the first time that I haven't done so. And it felt in a way be, because it was part of the pandemic and I felt so emotionally dysregulated that I kind of needed to jump back and forth. So that'll be interesting to see how it's different. And I'm assuming that since the concerts aren't for another week and a half, that that you haven't heard a rehearsal of it yet. So you probably haven't heard it performed, I'm guessing. Today, I am meeting with Martin. So I'm very excited about that. And we had a couple Zoom meetings. So I've heard little snippets, but I think I'm hearing the full piece today for the first time. So I'm very excited. Terrific. Well, I hope that goes well. Um, when you are composing, how much do you factor in how you think an audience is going to respond to it? And not in terms of whether they're going to like it or not, but what you want to, want, what you want to invoke in, in, in their psyche as they're listening to it and it's unfurling. Yeah, I think I only think about the audience's emotional response when I'm thinking about pacing. Um, so I'm very much kind of in my own emotions and world when I'm actually writing. And then it's sort of a question of, because I'm so familiar with my ideas and spend so much time with them, are they moving at a pace that, that an audience member can digest fully hearing it for the first time? So I think that's kind of an important part of, you know, because otherwise you don't want to think too much about the audience. But, um, you know, when a listener is really hearing something for the first time, do they have time to process it so that they can go on that journey? Um, and actually my, my partner, Zach, helps me with that. He listens to the piece, you know, on the computer, Sibelius, he listens to it with me and he'll let me know if things are moving too quickly and he can't follow it. Um, so that's important to me. Well, it's interesting. Listeners typically are are get maybe one chance to hear a piece unless it gets picked up by other orchestras or companies or the same orchestra as yeah. the LA Phil did with Underneath the Sheen, give it more than one performance. So what are the challenges for you after a world premiere in allowing other opportunities for people to hear this music through other performances of the work? Yeah, I mean, I guess you kind of hope for a recording or a uh, second performance. Um, but honestly, I'm kind of on to the next piece in a way. Um, I keep telling myself, you know, I want to spend time getting my existing works out. Um, but I don't know, I sort of move on. I think you kind of have to. You don't you don't worry about the, the legacy of a piece or the, the lifetime of a piece because you've moved on? No, because I'm I think my next piece is already better, maybe, or I, you know, I, I guess when I, I feel like that's part of letting go of your work is, um, you know, when you finish a piece, you kind of are aware of its imperfections and things maybe you want to do differently. Like I, I do want to have more aggressive drums, you know, next time. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up a piece for the Boston Symphony and, you know, I'm, I'm focusing more on brass and, you know, just so I, I'm sort of, 
I, I don't know, I'm just kind of on, on to the next thing. It's interesting that you brought that up because I saw the video that you posted last month called Letting Go of Your Work, which I thought was refreshingly candid. Thank it's like, you. I don't think I've ever heard a composer speak that way before. And you ask a question towards the end where you, if there's an unfiltered, more direct version of my sound that comes out when I'm not trying to make things perfect. One month later and a week before the world premiere of this work, do you have an answer to that question? Well, can you, if you ask me next week, I <laughs> might have an answer because uh, I haven't heard this, this movement, you know, that I, that I wrote that I felt was so different than the previous two because it was, it was, I was just trying to get it out. Um, and it's, it's so much more tonal. I mean, it has a key signature, you know, God forbid it has a key <laughs> signature. Uh, and, um, it's just, and it's very repetitive and, um, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes. You know, that, that there is, uh, not that one is better than the other, but there is a more distilled version of my voice that comes out in this third movement because I was just sort of letting go and not uh, analyzing it. So it's a simpler version of, of maybe, because you know, you write music and, it, and then you sort of complicate it. Like you, like you write an idea and then you expand and develop it and vary it. And so in a way it's, it's, it's building out. And so it's interesting to see what, what it is when it's just the sort of more pure distilled um, thing. And if that feels like enough to me well, you asked that question last month, how far into writing for, for Boston were you at that time or are you now? And how do you think those thoughts are influencing what you're doing for the new work? I mean, I always, I always try to, try to do something different in each piece. Um, and so, and, and just a little bit different. And I don't mean like create a whole new sound world, but like I was saying, like feature the brass more, feature the drums more, be a little bit more uh, simple and direct. Um, but you know, I haven't heard the Boston piece either. So that's also why I don't quite have an answer. Um, with a lot of these orchestral pieces, uh, you spend, especially since we're still kind of playing catch up from the pandemic, um, I mean, I've, I've written all this orchestral music over the pandemic that I haven't heard. Um, so, and I have a piece for the Cincinnati Symphony in April that I wrote, you know, in 2019, and I haven't heard that. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like in a way I have all of these ideas, but, um, and I've been trying to develop and change and evolve, but I haven't heard the results yet. So... That's why I don't quite have an answer to that question. Is that frustrating, having pieces held for so long before they get a chance to be heard by you or anyone else? No, I mean, I, I mean, the, the pandemic was incredibly frustrating, of course. Um, and also, I want to clarify that I, I made it sound like I was writing throughout the pandemic, and that's not the case. I, I was. Um, I was very, very much stepped away from writing for a, a while, um, you know, for maybe about six months of it. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I think I felt like I trusted that the pieces would premiere. Um, and so I didn't feel the same kind of panic or despair, I think, that many composers and artists felt where there really was no guarantee that the pieces would see the light of day. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm just sort of okay with, with being patient, yeah. Now, the LA Phil had announced that your violin concerto was gonna be premiered in May. Obviously that was postponed, but on that program, it was paired with the Mueller Fifth. This program it's paired with the Beethoven Seventh. And I'm wondering if you think that, that there is a better conversation to be had between your work and the Mahler or your work in the Beethoven? Oh, and, if, and if you had a preference, which it would be? I, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think, you know, Mahler is maybe a, I feel more affinity to some of his work um, and his sound world. Uh, 
than Beethoven, but um, I don't really think about what the piece is programmed with. Um, and honestly, it's always either Mahler or Beethoven. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think once I got programmed with Debussy, that was exciting because, um, you know, color and his impressionistic style is very, uh, very impactful to me. Um, but I, I, I do feel quite removed, I think, from Mahler and Beethoven. So I don't really have a preference. If you if you could program your work with any composer or a couple composers, who would they be? Well, I, my biggest influences, I would think uh, George Crumb. I'd love to 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 be on a concert with George Crumb uh, and Sofia Gubaidzelina. I think they. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to be on programs with with more contemporary uh, composers. Although even you know they are now. <laughs> Um, of, you know, older generations. But um, yeah, I think that kind of ritualistic sound world that they both share is kind of otherworldly. Um, I, I don't know if it's if you can hear that in my music, but I'm definitely influenced and inspired by the two of them. During the pandemic, you know, a lot of organizations came up with different ways of providing an outlet for or an opportunity for people to hear music that weren't able to go into the concert hall. The LA Philharmonic did their concerts on the stage at the Hollywood Bowl. A group like the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra made complete videos that sometimes combined performance and oftentimes had nothing but non-performance material as part of it. What role do you think and would you like filmed programming to be part of the way we get music out into the world moving forward? Yeah, that's a really important question. I mean, I think ideally, you know, a filmed work is its own artistic performance, you know, and so a lot of the, I mean, I know, you know, everyone was adapting quickly, but, you know, the sort of live streams or the, the filmed stage or the, you know, the boxes with the, with the faces, I feel like um, that was hard for me to watch during the pandemic because it just made me feel like, it just reminded me that I wasn't there, you know, um, and that it just wasn't good and as good as being live. But, you know, now, of course, we're getting more creative, uh, you know, interpretations where it's actually more like an actual music video, um, an actual, film um, that has direction and lighting and and I think in order to be competitive with all of the <laughs> offerings on the internet um, you know uh, classical music needs to be creating music videos like every other genre has done for decades and decades um, you know I don't know anything about the logistics of that or the budget for that or anything like that but um, I would love to see that alongside live performances. Um, and, it, and it does make music more accessible. Well, and that was the other part of the question that I wanted to ask you because you talked about, you know, when you, your experience in the prison and, and finding about access and accessibility of music. And of course there's an economic component that precludes yeah. a lot of people from being able to go to a concert hall. So I'm wondering if you feel like these music videos help provide some balance to the inequity of who can afford to go to a concert hall versus who cannot. Absolutely. But it has to be its own curated, created thing. It can't just be a lesser version of the live stage because um, I just think that's not satisfying to anyone. I mean, at that point, I'd, I'd rather just listen to a recording and imagine something <laughs> in my head. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's crucial to the survival of the art form for it to become more accessible. How much do you think new music is important in the survival of the art form? Incredibly important. I mean, if <laughs> if people aren't writing new music, then there's no music. I mean, it, it there's no development and continuation of the art form in response to contemporary times. You know, that's what we need, even if a lot of it or most of it gets forgotten, you know, that's okay. It's, it's, it's developing 
the art form and the genre and then it'll someone else will take that and respond to whatever's happening in 50 years you know right and also it's the only way to build new new fans of the music i mean you can't just program a cycle of beethoven every couple of years and assume that though you're though the older subscriber base might be very happy with what they're comfortable with you're not going to excite people who feel like that's all there is yeah well, it's interesting you brought up Sofia Gabaldalina because I read an interview that she gave and she said, there is a deep necessity for human beings to realize his or her unconscious. This is art. This is not only music, but it's an art. This is what art does. It's absolutely necessary. Do you agree with her? And if so, how do you think your work helps you realize your unconscious? Well, first of all, I a thousand percent agree with her. <laughs> um, my work is a way for me to process how I feel, to process the images that come into my mind that are in my unconscious, my dreams, all of that goes into, you know, my music. Sometimes even I get ideas for titles, you know, in, in my, from my dreams. Um, and the hope is that, um, by being as authentic and true to how I feel as possible, that it will give, it will create a space for others to access their own internal world. So that's why I, I don't really share what my pieces are about. You know, I want to give some imagery that people can imagine and latch on to, but, you know, yes, working on it would helped me with process my unconscious, but I want um, when people are listening, I don't, I, I don't want them to be distracted by, by me. I want them to be, it to be my music to be a vehicle for them to access their own um, unconscious. And that's one of the beautiful things about music is because it does not have words. Um, it gives you that freedom to, to access your own imagination.